Hello, welcome to Storytime with Moog. I am Moog, and today we are reading The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, starting with chapter six and maybe finishing. <laughs> the first started reading on yesterday. On yesterday, I started reading The Hacienda by Isabel Cañas, and I have to read it before Sunday at noon because I'm going to a book club, but this is how far I am. I've read this much. I have this much to go. Um, I am on page 115. There's 342 page. Oh, wait, no. There's 337 pages. So I got a bit to go, but it's fine. The book is fine. <laughs> uh, it's like supposed to be like a scary, like haunted house type thing. That's what's happening so far. And I, I'm not scared. <laughs> I am a big old weenie when it comes to like horror TV shows or horror like films and stuff but I'm finding that I'm not when I read it um there I guess there's just like that divide or I'm just not very imaginative <laughs> but I'm not scared at all and like things are happening like she's seeing things like covered in blood and she's seeing like skeletons and like creepy like eyes and stuff like that like in the darkness and it's always cold and she always feels like people are or, like something or someone is watching her so we'll see how it goes the part that I'm at again I'm less than 50% of the way through so I do not think that this is a spoiler but the part that I'm at she is now by herself her husband has gone off to the capital or wherever he went I don't remember um and she has enlisted the help of like a young priest and an old priest not really but it there is a young priest involved uh his name is andres and he knows the house and so like they just did their first walk through without these like incense type things to like ward them away so that he could get like the full scope of what's happening and so like they just saw their like first haunting together and that's where i stopped reading so it's fine so far. It's fine. I'm going to keep reading it. I'm just not scared. I don't know what would scare me, but I'm not scared. We need to talk when I finish. Okay, cool. Curious about what you think about the ending. All right. Excellent. Okay. Let's switch gears. We're doing a hard gear shift. I had no no clever segues from goobers to time travel. I wish I could travel back in time to the 90s when that was a thing and very popular. And I could try it and not feel weird about having to search for it today. There we go. Speaking of time travel, <laughs> let's do our recap. Okay, so we are halfway, a little bit over halfway. So what has happened so far? Um, it's a weird, like, inception-y, layered way of telling a story. So we are getting this story told to us by somebody at a shindig who is listening to somebody tell this story. So we got layers going on. And the person telling the story, we, they don't have a name. They're just called the Time Traveler. So we named them Stinky, obviously. Um... And so right now what's happening is Stinky is telling the story. He has gone into the future, super, super far into the future. I don't remember what the year, um, but real far. And observing what the human race becomes and what his he's actually finding. He just figured this out. This was like the last thing that we've read is that the human race has sort of diverged and become two different species. We have the Eloi, who are on top of the surface. They are very into arts and very into eating fruits and just very happy and joyful, and they laugh a lot and all those sorts of things. And then we have the Morlocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have the Morlocks, who are 
ape-like creatures who live underground and do not like light. The alloys do not like shadow. They do not like dark. So it's a very thinly veiled <laughs> commentary on classism. Uh, the Morlocks are the laborers and they're the ones who are like getting it done. And then the alloy are like frolicking about all day long. Uh, so those are the two different races. Our time traveler Stinky has traveled to this time and has been exploring with um, the alloys and has made a friend. And he goes back to his time machine and his time machine has been taken. It's gone. Doesn't know where it is. Doesn't know who took it. None of these things. And as he was searching for it, that's how he came upon the Morlocks. And we don't know why it was taken. We haven't really talked to the Morlocks yet. So we don't know if we're able to communicate with them yet or anything. Um, and I th think that that's the like high level of where we're at. Of course, as we're going along and something pops up that I didn't mention, I will say, hold up. We already knew this. <laughs> it is halfway through. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So we will probably finish today. It might be a little bit of a longer stream, and that's cool. Okay, so we are starting with chapter six. Let's do it. Chapter six. It may seem odd to you, but it was two days before I could follow up the newfound clue in what was manifestly the proper way. I felt a peculiar shrinking from those pallid bodies. They were just the half-bleached color of the worms and things one sees preserved in spirit in a zoological museum. And they were filthily cold to touch. Probably my shrinking was largely due to, to the sympathetic influence of the alloy whose disgust of the Morlocks I now began to appreciate. The next night I did not sleep well. Probably my health was a little disordered. I was oppressed with perplexity and doubt. Once or twice I had a feeling of intense fear for which I could perceive no definite reason. I remember creeping noiselessly into the great hall where the little people were sleeping in their moonlight. That light that night, Weena was among them. Weena is our friend. And feeling reassured by their presence. It occurred to me, even then, that in the course of a few days, the moon must pass through its final quarter, and the nights grow dark. When the appearances of these unpleasant creatures from below, these whitened lemurs, these, this new vermin that had replaced the old, might be more abundant. And on both these days, I had the restless feeling of one who shirks an inevitable duty. I felt assured that the time machine was only to be recovered by boldly penetrating these underground mysteries. Yet I could not face the mystery. If only I had had a companion, it would have been different. But I was so horribly alone, and even to clamber down into the darkness of the well appalled me. I don't know if you will understand my feeling— but I never felt quite safe at my back. It was this restlessness, this insecurity, perhaps, that drove me further and further afield in my exploring expeditions. Going to the southwestward towards the rising country that is now called Combe Wood, I observed far off, in the direction of 19th century Banstead, a vast green structure, different in character, from any I had hitherto seen. It was larger than the largest of the palaces or ruins I knew, and the façade had an oriental look, the face of it having the luster as well as the pale green tint, a kind of bluish green of a certain type of Chinese porcelain. This difference in aspect suggested a difference in use, and I was minded to push on and explore. But the day was growing late, and I had come upon the sight of the place after a long and tiring circuit. So I resolved to hold over the adventure for the following day, and I ventured to the welcome and the caresses of little Weena, 
but next morning i perceived clearly enough that my curiosity regarding the palace of green porcelain was a piece of self-deception to enable me to shirk by another day an experience i dreaded i resolved i would make the descent without further waste of time and started out in the early morning towards a well near the ruins of granite and aluminum little weena ran with me she danced beside me to the well but when she saw me lean over the mouth and look downward she seemed strangely disconcerted good-bye little weena i said kissing her and then putting her down i began to feel over the parapet for the climbing hooks rather hastily i may as well confess for i feared my courage might leak away at first she watched me in amazement then she gave a most piteous cry and running to me she began to pull at me with her little hands i think her opposition nerved me rather to proceed i shook her off perhaps a little roughly and in another moment i was in the throat of the well i saw her agonized face over the parapet and smiled to reassure her then i had to look down at the unstable hooks to which i clung i had to clamber down a shaft of perhaps two hundred yards the descent was effected by means of metallic bars projecting from the sides of the well and these being adapted to the needs of a creature much smaller and lighter than myself i was speedily cramped and fatigued by the descent and not simply fatigued one of the bars bent suddenly under my weight and almost swung me off into the blackness beneath for a moment i hung by one hand and after that experience i did not dare to rest again though my arms and back were presently acutely painful i went on clambering down the sheer descent with as quick a motion as possible glancing upward i saw the aperture a small blue disk in which a star was visible while little weena's head showed as ra as a round black projection the thudding sound of a machine below grew louder and more oppressive everything save that little disk above was profoundly dark and when i looked up again weena had disappeared don't go stinky don't go <laughs> he is clambering all over the place get it together stinky i was in an agony of discomfort i had some thought of trying to go up the shaft again and leave the underworld alone but even while i turned this over in my mind i continued to descend at last with intense relief i saw dimly coming up a foot to the right of me a slender loophole in the wall swinging myself in i found it was the aperture of a narrow horizontal tunnel in which i could lie down and rest it was not too soon my arms ached my back was cramped and i was trembling with the prolonged terror of a fall besides this the unbroken darkness had a distressing effect upon my eyes the air was full of the throb and hum of machinery pumping air down the shaft i do not know how long i lay i was roused by a soft hand touching my face starting up in the darkness i snatched at my matches and hastily striking one i saw three stooping white creatures similar to the one i had seen above ground in the ruin hastily return retreating before the light living as they did in what appeared to me impenetrable darkness their eyes were abnormally large and sensitive just as are the pupils of the abysmal fishes and they reflected the light in the same way i have no doubt they could see me in that rayless obscurity and they did not seem to have any fear of me apart from the light but so soon as i struck a match in order to see them they fled incontinently vanishing into dark gutters and tunnels from which their eyes glared at me in the strangest fashion i tried to call to them but the language they had was apparently different from that of the overworld people so that i was needs le so that i was needs left to my own unaided effort and the thought of flight before my exploration was even then in my mind but i said to myself you are in for it now and feeling my way along the tunnel i found the noise of machinery grow louder 
Presently, the walls fell away from me, and I came to a large open space, and, striking another match, saw that I had entered a vast, arced cavern, which stretched into utter darkness beyond the range of my light. The view I had of it was as much as one could see in the burning of a match. Necessarily, my memory is vague. Great shapes, like big machines, rose out of the dimness and cast grotesque black shadows in which dim spectral morlocks sheltered from the glare. The place, by the by, was very stuffy and oppressive, and the faint halitus of freshly shed blood was in the air. Some way down the central vista was a little table of white metal laid with what seemed a meal. The Morlocks, at any rate, were carnivorous. Even at the time, I remember wondering what large animal could have survived to furnish the red joint I saw. It was all very indistinct. The heavy smell, the big, unmeaning shapes, the obscure figures lurking in the dark, and only waiting for the darkness to come at me again. Then the match burned down and stung my fingers and fell, a wriggling red spot in the blackness. I have thought since how particularly ill-equipped I was for such an experience. When I had started with the time machine, I had started with the absurd assumption that the men of the future would certainly be infinitely ahead of ourselves and all their appliances. I had come without arms, without medicine, without anything to smoke. At times I mixed tobacco frightfully even without enough matches. You would have more matches if you didn't strike them so constantly. It seems like every other every other thing he does, he's striking matches. Calm yourself, Stinky. We do not need those many matches to be struck. If only I had thought of a Kodak. I could have flashed that glimpse of the underworld in a second and examined it at leisure. But... As it was, I stood there with only the weapons and the powers that nature had endowed me with. Hands, feet, and teeth. These, and four safety matches that still remained to me. Alright, I was wondering how many matches we had left, because it seemed like we used so many. We have four. Excellent. I was afraid to push my way in among all this machinery in the dark. And it was only with my last glimpse of light I discovered that my store of matches had run low. I had It had never occurred to me until that moment that there was any need to economize them. And I had wasted almost half the box in astonishing the upper worlders to whom fire was a novelty. It's a budding arsonist. <laughs> now, as I say, I had four left. And while I stood in the dark, a hand touched mine. Lank fingers came feeling over my face, and I was sensible of a peculiar, unpleasant odor. I fancied I'd heard the breathing of a crowd of those dreadful little beings about me. I felt the box of matches in my hand being gently disengaged, and other hands behind me plucking at my clothing. The sense of these unseen creatures examining me was indescribably unpleasant. The sudden realization of my ignorance of their ways of thinking and doing it came home to me very vividly in the darkness. I shouted at them as loudly as I could. They started away, and then I could feel them approaching me again. They clutched at me more boldly, whispering odd sounds to each other. I shivered violently and shouted again rather discordantly. This time, they were not so seriously alarmed, and they made an odd laughing noise as they came back to me. I will confess I was horribly frightened. I determined to strike another match and escape under the protection of its glare. I did so, and eking out the fl flicker with a scrap of paper from my pocket, I made good my retreat to the narrow tunnel. But I had scarce entered this when my light was blown out, and in the darkness I could hear the Morlocks rustling like wind among the trees, and pattering like the rain as they hurried after me. In a moment I was clutched by several hands, and there was no mistaking that they were trying to haul me back. 
I struck another light and lay waved it in their dazzled faces. Okay, we just said that we only have four matches. And here we are. We've already used two more. So now we only have two matches. The count on Sesame Street would be so proud of my mathematical skills. <laughs> I struck another light and waved it in their dazzled faces. You can scarce imagine how nauseatingly inhuman they looked. Those pale, chinless faces and great, lidless, pinkish-gray eyes as they stared in their blindness and bewilderment. But I did not stay to look, I promise you. I retreated again, and when my second match had ended, I struck my third. It had almost burned through when I reached the opening into the shaft. I lay down on the edge, up for the throb of the great pump below made me giddy. Then I felt sideways for the projecting hooks, and as I did so, my feet were grasped from behind, and I was violently tugged backwards. I lit my last match, and it incontinently went out. But I had my hand on the climbing bars now, and, kicking violently, I disengaged myself from the clutches of the Morlocks and was speedily clambering up the shaft while they stayed peering and blinking up at me, all but one little wretch who followed me for, the some, for some way, and well-nigh secured my boot as a trophy. That climb seemed interminable to me. With the last twenty or thirty feet of it, a deadly nausea came upon me. I had the greatest difficulty in keeping my hold. The last few yards was a frightful struggle against this faintness. Several times my head swam, and I felt all the sensations of falling. At last, however, I got over the well mouth somehow, and staggered out of the ruin into the blinding sunlight. I fell upon my face. Even the soil smelt sweet and clean. Then I remember Weena kissing my hands and ears and the voices of others among the alloy. Then, for a time, I was insensible. End of chapter six. All right, so... <laughs> time Traveler Stinky decides um, that he's not going to decide to go down there to get his time machine. And then it's like, you know what? I gotta do this. So he spent a couple days still sort of ignoring it and then decides to go down the well. And he does so. And it, he's clambering about. He has a terrible time of getting down. <laughs> um, and when he finally does, he does come, you know, face to face with several Morlocks. And... In doing so, he hasn't prepared anything. He doesn't know how to communicate with them. He doesn't know anything of their culture. And he just mistakenly thought that it would be the same as the Eloi who live on, like, ab the above world, upper worlds. And he's wrong. <laughs> Um, and he's a little scared, and he lights a match, and so we see them. We get to see what they look like, and they have huge, massive eyeballs that are, like, gray-pink, and they're very good, obviously, at seeing in the dark, and so, like, the match scares them and probably hurts their eyes, and so they, like, shuffle away, and <laughs> then we're like, all right, well, Time Traveler Stinky only has four matches because Time Traveler Stinky tried to be cool and just kept lighting matches for the upper worlders. And as soon as he says that, he tries to leave, but in doing so, uses all of his matches. He's like, oh man, I really need to not use them so often. And then proceeds to use them so often. Um... But he, he escapes. He keeps lighting the matches and getting out. And one of the Morlocks took his shoe. <laughs> but now he's above ground and it's like, oh my god, it smells so nice up here. The sun is shining. My girl Weena is here. Stinky needs more matches or a flamethrower. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think it's interesting. Um, like, it feels like a lot of 
like time traveling going into the future, the assumption is that everything is going to be so much more advanced, like technology wise. So it is interesting that one, Stinky the Time Traveler has mentioned this, and two, that they're not, that they don't have, you know, modernized fire or, you know, whatever. Their technology is different. And I think that's cool. Also, their language is just wildly different, and that's that's cool. Language is cool. Okay. Chapter 7. Now, indeed, I seemed in a worse case than before. Hitherto, except during my night's anguish at the loss of the time machine, I had felt a sustaining hope of ultimate escape but that hope was staggered by these new discoveries. Hitherto I had merely thought myself impeded by the childish simplicity of the little people, and by some un unknown forces which I had only to understand to overcome. But there was an altogether new element in the sinking quality of the Morlocks, a something inhuman and malign. Instinctively, I loathed them. Before, I had felt as a man might feel who had fallen into a pit. My concern was with the pit and how to get out of it. Now, I felt like a beast in a trap whose enemy would come up upon him soon. Fry, when Fry goes to the future in Futurama, doesn't it show society getting destroyed twice? Yes! You're totally right. You're totally right. Yes. This is obviously that time. Because... This is canon in Futurama. <laughs> Don't fact check that. It's 100% true. <laughs> Chapter 8. The enemy I dreaded may surprise you. It was the darkness of the new moon. Weena had put this into my head by some at first incomprehensible remarks about the dark nights. It was not now such a very difficult problem to guess what the coming dark nights meant. The moon was on the wane. Each night there was a longer interval there was a longer interval of darkness, and I now understood to some slight degree at least the reason for the fear of the little upper world people for the dark. I wondered vaguely what foul villainy it might be that the Morlocks did under the new moon. I felt pretty sure now that my second hypothesis was all wrong. The upper world people might once have been the favored aristocracy, 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 but the Morlocks, their mechanical servants, and the Morlocks, their mechanical servants, but that had long since passed away. The two species that had resulted from the evolution of man were sliding down towards, or had already arrived at, an altogether new relationship. The Eloi, like the Carolingian kings, had decayed to a mere beautiful futility. They still possessed the earth on sufferance, since the Morlocks, subterranean for innumerable generations, had come at last to find the daylight surface intolerable. And the Morlocks made their garments, I inferred, and maintained them in their hab habitual needs, perhaps through the survival of an old habit of service. They did it as a standing horse paws with his foot, or as a man enjoys killing animals in sport because ancient and departed necessities had impressed it on an organism. But, clearly, the old order was already in part reversed. The nemesis of the delicate ones was creeping on apace. Ages ago, thousands of generations ago, man had thrust his brother man out of the ease and the sunshine, and now that brother was coming back changed. Already the alloy had begun to learn one old lesson anew. They were becoming reacquainted with fear. Fear is capital. And suddenly there came into my mind the memory of the meat I had seen in the underworld. It seemed odd how it floated into my mind, not stirred up 
as it were by the current of my meditations, but coming in almost like a question from outside. I tried to recall the form of it. I had a vague sense of something familiar, but I could not tell what it was at the time. Still, however, helpless, the little people in the presence of their mysterious fear, I was differently constituted. I came out of this age of ours, this ripe prime of the human race, when fear does not paralyze and mystery has lost its terrors. I, at least, would defend myself. Without further delay, I determined to make myself arms and a fastness where I might sleep. With that refuge as a base, I could face this strange world with some of that confidence I had lost in realizing to what creatures night by night I lay exposed. I felt I could never sleep again until my bed was secure from them. I shuddered with horror to think how they must already have examined me. I wandered during the afternoon along the valley of the Thames, but found nothing that commended itself to my mind as inaccessible. All the buildings and trees seemed easily practicable to such dexterous climbers as the Morlocks, to judge by their wells, must be. Then the tall pinnacles of the palace of green porcelain and the polished gleam of its walls came back to my memory, and in the evening, taking Weena like a child upon my shoulder, I went up the hills toward the southwest. The distance, I had reckoned, was seven or eight miles, but it must have been nearer eighteen. I had first seen the place on a moist afternoon when distances are deceptively diminished. I don't think I've ever described an afternoon as being moist. No, I have not. In addition, the heel of one of my shoes was loose, and a nail was working through the sole. They were comfortable old shoes I wore about indoors, so that I was lame. And it was already long past sunset when I came in sight of the palace, silhouetted black against the pale yellow of the sky. Weena had been hugely delighted when I began to carry her, but after a while she desired me to let her down, and ran along by the side of me, occasionally darting off on either hand to pick flowers to stick in my pockets. My pockets had always puzzled Weena but at the last she had concluded that they were an eccentric kind of vase for floral decoration. At least she utilized them for that purpose, and that reminds me, in changing my jacket I found... The time traveler paused, put his hand into his pocket, and silently placed two withered flowers, not unlike very large white mallows, upon the little table. Then he resumed his narrative. As the hush of evening crept over the world and we proceeded over the hill crest towards Wimbledon, Weena grew tired and wanted to return to the house of Grey Stone. But I pointed out the distant pinnacles of the palace of green porcelain to her and contrived to make her understand that we were seeking a refuge there from her fear. You know that great pause that comes upon things before the dusk? Even the breeze stops in the trees. To me, there is always an air of expectation about that evening stillness. The sky was clear, remote, and empty save for a few horizontal bars far down in the sunset. Well, that night, the expectation took the color of my fears. In that darkling calm, my senses seemed preternaturally sharpened. I fancied I could even feel the hollowness of the ground beneath my feet, could, indeed, almost see through it to the Morlocks on their ant hill going hither and thither and waiting for the dark. In my excitement I fancied that they would receive my invasion of their burrows as a declaration of war, and why had they taken my time machine? So we went on in the quiet, and the twilight deepened into night. The clear blue of the distance faded, and one star after another came out. The ground grew dim and the trees black. Weena's fears and her fatigue grew upon her. I took her into my arms and talked to her and caressed her, 
Then, as the darkness grew deeper, she put her arms around my neck and, closing her eyes tightly, pressed her face against my shoulder. So we went down a long slope into a valley, and there in the dimness I almost walked into a little river. This I waited, and went up the opposite side of the valley, past a number of sleeping houses, and by a statue, a fawn, or some figure, minus the head. Here, too, were Acacias, possibly, A-C-A-C-I-A-S. A-C-A-C-I-A-S. A shrub or tree of the tribe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there we go. A-C-A-C-I-A-S. That almost reminds me of that one Arthur episode when they're doing the spelling bee and he learns how to spell aardvark and he puts it to a song. A-A-R-D-V-A-R-K. I always remember how to spell aardvark because of Arthur. Thanks, PBS. <laughs> so far, I had seen nothing of the Morlocks. But it was yet early in the night, and the darker hours before the old moon rose were still to come. From the brow of the next hill I saw a thick wood spreading wide and black before me. I hesitated at this. I could see no end to it, either to the right or the left. Feeling tired, my feet in particular, were very sore. I carefully lowered Weena from my shoulder as I halted, and sat down upon the turf. I could no longer see the palace of green porcelain, and I was in doubt of my direction. I looked into the thickness of the wood and thought of what it might hide. Under that dense tangle of branches, one would be out of sight of the stars. Even where there was no other lurking danger, a danger I did not care to let my imagination loose upon, there would still be all the roots to stumble over— and the tree balls to strike against. I was very tired, too, after the excitements of the day, so I decided that I would not face it, but would pass the night upon the open hill. Weena, I was glad to find, was fast asleep. I carefully wrapped her in my jacket and sat down beside her to wait for the moonrise. The hillside was quiet and deserted, but from the black of the wood there came now and then a stir of living things. Above me shone the stars, for the night was very clear. I felt a certain sense of friendly comfort in their twinkling. All the old constellations had gone from the sky, however. That slow movement which is imperceptible in a hundred human lifetimes had long since rearranged them in unfamiliar groupings. But the Milky Way— it seemed to me, was still the same tattered streamer of stardust as of yore. Southward, as I judged it, was a very bright red star that was new to me. It was even more splendid than our own green Sirius. And amid all these scintillating points of light, one bright planet shone kindly and steadily like the face of an old friend. Looking at these stars suddenly dwarfed my own troubles and all the gravities of terrestrial life. I thought of their unfathomable distance and the slow, inevitable drift of their movements out of the unknown past into the unknown future. I thought of the great precessional cycle that the pole of the earth describes. Only forty times had that silent revolution occurred during all the years that I had traversed. And during these few revolutions, all the activity, all the traditions, the complex organizations, the nations, languages, literatures, aspirations, even the mere memory of man as I knew him, had been swept out of existence. Instead were these frail creatures who had forgotten their high ancestry, and the white things of which I went in terror. Then I thought of the great fear that was between the two species— and for the first time, with a sudden shiver, came the clear knowledge of what the meat I had seen might be. Yet it was too horrible. 
I looked at little Weena sleeping beside me, her white face and starlight under the stars, and forthwith dismissed the thought. Through that long night I held my mind off the Morlocks as well as I could, and wild the way, oh, wild away the time by trying to fancy I could find signs of the old constellations in the new confusion. The sky kept very clear, except for a hazy cloud or so. No doubt I dozed at times. Then, as my vigil wore on, came a, faintless, a faintness in the eastward sky like the reflection of some colorless fire, and the old moon rose, thin and peaked and white, and close behind, and overtaking it and overflowing it, the dawn came, pale at first, and then growing pink and warm. No more locks had approached us. Indeed, I had seen none upon the hill that night, and in the confidence of renewed day it almost seemed to me that my fear had been unreasonable. I stood up and found my foot with those loose heel, swollen at the ankle, and painful under the heel. So I sat down again, took off my shoes, and flung them away. I awakened Weena, and we went down into the wood, now green and pleasant, instead of black and forbidding. We found some fruit wherewith to break our fast. We soon met others of the dainty ones, laughing and dancing in the sunlight, as though there was no such thing in nature as the night. And then I thought once more of the meat that I had seen. I felt assured now of what it was, and from the bottom of my heart I pitied this last feeble rill from the great flood of humanity. Clearly, at some time in the long ago of human decay, the Lamorlocks' food had run short. Possibly they had lived on rats and such like vermin, even now man is far less discriminating and exclusive in his food than he was, far less than any monkey. His prejudice against human flesh is no deep-seated instinct, and so these inhuman sons of meat. I tried to look at the thing in a scientific spirit. After all, they were less human and more remote than our cannibal ancestors of three or four thousand years ago, and the intelligence that would have made this state of things a torment had gone. Why should I trouble myself? These alloy were mere fatted cattle, which the ant-like Morlocks preserved and preyed upon, probably saw to the breeding of, and there was Weena, dancing at my side. Then I tried to preserve myself from the horror that was coming upon me, by regarding it as a rigorous punishment of human selfishness. Man had been content to live in ease and delight upon the labors of his fellow man, and taken necessity as his watchword and excuse, and in the fullness of time necessity had come home to him. Necessity is capitalized both times. I even tried a Carlyle-like scorn of this wretched aristocracy in decay but this attitude of mind was impossible. However great their intellectual degradation, the alloy had kept too much of the human form not to claim my sympathy and to make me perforce a sharer in their degradation and their fear. I had at that time very vague ideas as to the course I should pursue. My first was to secure some safe place of refuge and to make myself such arms of metal or stone as I could contrive. That necessity was immediate. In the next place, I hoped to procure some means of fire so that I should have the weapon of a torch at hand, for nothing, I knew, would be more efficient against these Morlocks. Then I wanted to arrange some contrivance to break open the doors of bronze under the white sphinx. I had in mind a battering ram. I had a persuasion that if I could enter those doors and carry a blaze of light before me, I could discover the time machine and escape. I could not imagine the Morlocks were strong enough to move it far away. Lena, I had resolved to bring with me to our own time, and turning such schemes over in my mind, I pursued our way towards the building which my fancy had chosen of our dwelling." 
end of chapter seven. Okay. So we know that Weena doesn't go back with him. <laughs> Let's just address that right now. At least um, unless she's like hiding upstairs or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um also okay there have been several times when stinky time traveler time traveler stinky however you refer to this person has mentioned how unprepared they are and i understand not being prepared bringing the wrong equipment or something like that but the dude brought nothing he was wearing in like indoor shoes like why aren't you wearing boots why? I feel like you should have prepared for the worst. Why did you only bring one little thing of matches? I don't understand. Did you bring a hat? Are you going to get sunburned? <laughs> so, all right, this chapter, not a lot of action happened. It was a lot of uh, commentary and just observational stuff between the Morlocks and the Eloi. But we did get um, that the new moon is coming, so it's going to be all dark. And Time tra Traveler Stinky and the Eloi are scared because that's when the Morlocks can come out. He definitely thought that there would be sidewalks and no need for outdoor shoes, apparently. So with the coming new moon... Um, Stinky has decided to prepare and, like, I don't know, thinking that him dropping down into their well might be perceived as an act of war. Um, I have many questions. <laughs> One. Is it an act of war? They didn't seem hostile. They just mostly seemed curious. Like, when they were, like, pawing at his clothes and stuff and, like, checking out his face, I'm pretty sure they were just curious and interested. It didn't seem like they were going to cause him any harm. Um, also, it is, and this is us just going along with our narrator, but it is assumed that this is, like, the new race, or these are these two races are the new human race. And I feel like that would not have been my guess. Like, I would have not assumed, like, oh, this is just humans in the the deep future. I would have thought that it was just, like, an, like both different animal species that have evolved to be able to do things to use tools to communicate with each other with you know gestures and language that is what my guess would have been because like part of me now that i think that they're not human is that he's gonna come across humans and they are going to be way more advanced. And they are going to be, like, not little. Like, he keeps talking about how little they are. And I just, I just don't know. I don't know. I have theories. They're probably all wrong. The Earth people have somewhat English. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I don't know. I guess we'll have to keep reading. <laughs> exactly we're not seeing them with our own eyes and we're not even seeing them like through one narrator's eyes if that makes sense so we'll see because yeah again it's like it's like the whole telephone thing so like we're listening to somebody talk we are listen we are getting the story relayed to us by somebody who is listening to somebody telling the story and as like that reminder every paragraph starts with quotes except for that one when he took the flower out which is kind of cool that he kept that flower 
like he kept it and like brought it back as like proof or whatever or maybe as like a memory of lena i don't know i don't know They'd have to look more like specific animal than like human for me to assume they were an offshoot of human. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. I get it. And yeah, like because we aren't seeing, because we aren't seeing and we aren't experiencing, you're totally right. You're totally right. I'm just, just out here with my questions. All right. Chapter 8. I don't know why I thought that this would take, like, for forever. But we really don't have that much <laughs> that much to go. So this might even be, like, a short stream. Like, we have this much to go. There's, like, nothing here. Let's see. We're about to start Chapter 8. There are... 12 chapters. We'll see. I'm probably wrong, but thank you. <laughs> How wild would that be? Okay, chapter eight. I found the palace of green porcelain when we approached it about noon, deserted and falling into ruin. Only ragged vestiges of glass remained in its windows, and great sheets of the green facing had fallen away from the corroded metallic framework. It lay very high upon a turfy down, and looking northeastward, before I entered it, I was surprised to see a large estuary, or even creek, where I judged Wandsworth and, ba and Battersea must have been. I thought that was going to say Wadsworth, and I was very excited. Wandsworth. I thought then, though I never followed up with the thought, of what might have happened, or might be happening, to the living things in the sea. <laughs> What's worth? <laughs> Wandsworth. Like, like Wanda. <laughs> The material of the palace proved on examination to be indeed porcelain, and along the face of it I saw an inscription in some unknown character. I thought, rather foolishly, that Weena might help me to interp interpret this, but I only learned that the bare idea of writing had never entered her head. She always seemed to me, I fancy, more human than she was, perhaps because of her affection was so human. Okay. There we go. Within the big valves of the door, which were open and broken, we found instead of the customary hall, a great gallery lit by many side windows. At the first glance, I was reminded of a museum. The tiled floor was thick with dust, and a remarkable array of miscellaneous objects was shrouded in the same gray covering. Then I perceived, standing straight and gaunt in the center of the hall, that was clearly the lower part of a huge skeleton. I recognized by the oblique feet that it was some extinct creature after the fashion of the Megatherium. The skull and the upper bones lay beside it in thick dust, and in one place where rainwater had dropped through a leak in the roof, the thing itself had been worn away. Further in the gallery was the huge skeleton barrel of the Brontosaurus. My museum hypothesis was confirmed. Going towards the side, I found what appeared to be sloping shelves, and clearing away the thick dust, I found the fam old familiar glass cases of our own time. But they must have been airtight to judge from the fair preservation of some of their con con contents. Clearly, we stood among the ruins of some latter-day South Kingston. Here, apparently, was the paleontological section, and a very splendid array of fossils it must have been, though the inevitable process of decay that had been staved off for a time had, through the extinction of bacteria and fungi, lost ninety-nine hundredths of its force, was nevertheless 
with extreme sureness if with extreme slowness at work again upon all its treasures here and there i found traces of the two of the little people in the shape of rare fossils broken to pieces or threaded in strings upon reeds and the cases had in some instincts been boldly removed by the morlocks as i judged the place was very silent the thick dust deadened our footsteps lena who had been rolling a sea urchin down the sloping glass of a case presently came as i stared about me and very quietly took my hand and stood beside me and at first i was so much surprised by this ancient monument of an intellectual age that i gave no thought to the possibilities it presented even my preoccupation about the time machine receded a little from my mind to judge from the size of the place this palace of green porcelain had a great deal more in it than a gallery of paleontology perhaps possibly historical galleries it, it might be even a library <gasps> to me at least in my present circumstances these would be vastly more interesting than this spectacle of old-time geology in decay exploring i found another short gallery running transversely to the first this appeared to be devoted to minerals and the sight of a block of sulphur set my mind running on gunpowder but i could find no saltpetre indeed no nitrates of any kind doubtless they had delinquished ages ago yet the sulphur hung in my mind and set up a train of thinking as for the rest of the contents of that gallery though on the whole they were the best preserved of all i saw i had little interest i am no specialist in mineralogy and i went on down a very ruinous aisle running parallel to the first hall i had entered apparently this section had been devoted to natural history but everything had long since passed out of recognition a few shriveled and blackened vestiges of what had once been stuffed animals desiccated mummies in jars that had once held spirit a brown dust of departed plants that was all i was sorry for that because i should have been glad to trace the patent readjustments by which the conquest of animated nature had been attained then we came to a gallery of simply colossal proportions but singularly ill-lit the floor of it running downward at a slight angle from the end at which i entered at intervals white globes hung from the ceiling many of them cracked and smashed which suggested that originally the place had been artificially lit here i was more in my element for rising on either side of me were the huge bulks of big machines all greatly corroded and many broken down but some still fairly complete you know i have a certain weakness for mechanisms and i was inclined to linger among these the more so as for the most part they had the interest of puzzles and i could make only the vaguest guesses as what they were for i fancied that if i could solve their puzzles i should find myself in possession of powers that might be of use against the morlocks suddenly lena came very close to my side so suddenly that she startled me had it not been for her i do not think i should have noticed that the floor of the gallery sloped at all there's a little a little footnote here our first footnote and it says it may be of course that the floor did not slope but that the museum was built into the side of a hill the end i had come in at was quite above ground and was lit by rare slit-like windows as you went down the length the ground came up against these windows until at last there was a pit like the area of a london house before each and only a narrow line of daylight at the top i went slowly along puzzling about the machines and had been too intent upon them to notice the gradual dimu diminution of the light until lena's increasing apprehensions drew my attention 
Then I saw that the gallery ran down at last into a thick darkness. I hesitated, and then as I looked round me I saw that the dust was less abundant and its surface less even. Further away towards the dimness it appeared to be broken by a number of small, narrow footprints. My sense of the immediate presence of the Morlocks revived at that. I felt that I was wasting my time in the academic examination of machinery. I called to mind that it was already far advanced in the afternoon, and that I had still no weapon, no refuge, and no means of making fire. And then down in the remote blackness of the gallery I heard a peculiar pattering, and the same odd noises I had heard down the well. I took Weena's hand. Then, struck with a sudden idea, I left her and turned to a machine from which projected a lever not unlike those in the signal box. Clambering upon the stand and grasping this le lever in my hand, I put all my weight upon it sideways. Suddenly Weena, deserted in the central aisle, began to whimper. I had judged the strength of the lever pretty correctly, for it snapped after a minute's strain, and I rejoined her with a mace in my hand more than sufficient, I judged, for any more lock skull I might encounter. And I longed very much to kill a Morlock or so. Very inhuman, you may think, to want to go killing one's own descendants, but it was impossible, somehow, to feel any humanity in the things. Only my disinclination to leave Weena, and a persuasion that if I began to slake my thirst for murder, my time machine might suffer, restrained me from going straight down the gallery and killing the brutes I heard. Well, mace in one hand and Weena in the other, I went out of that gallery and into another and still larger one, which at the first glance reminded me of a military chapel, hung with tattered flags. The brown and charred rags that hung from the from the sides of it, I presently recognized as the decaying vestiges of books. They had long since dropped to pieces, and every semblance of print had left them. But here and there were wrapped boards and cracked metallic clasps that told the tale well enough. Had I been a literary man, I might, perhaps, have moralized upon the futility of all ambition, but as it was— the thing that struck me with keenest force was the enormous waste of labor to which this somber wilderness of rotting paper testified. At the time, I will confess that I thought chiefly of the philosophical transaction of my own seventeen papers upon physical optics. Own descendants, Stinky is making broad assumptions about his personal life. Agreed. <laughs> also, if they're your own descendants... What are you doing with Weena? Hmm? Can you explain? No, you can't. Disgusting. <laughs> then, going up a broad staircase, I came to what may once have been a gallery of technical chemistry. And here, I had not a little hope of useful discoveries, except at one end where the roof had collapsed. This gallery was well preserved. I went eagerly to every unbroken case, and at last, in one of the really airtight cases, I found a box of matches. Very eagerly, I tried them. They were perfectly good. They were not even damp. I turned to Weena. Dance, I cried to her in her own tongue, for now I had a weapon indeed instead, oops, instead against the horrible creatures we feared. That's not what that says. For now I had a weapon, indeed, against the horrible creatures we feared. And so, in that derelict museum, upon the thick, soft carpeting of dust, to Weena's huge delight, I solemnly performed a kind of composite dance, whistling the land of the leal as cheerfully as I could. In part it was a modest can-can, in part a step dance, in part a skirt dance, so far as my tailcoat permitted, and in part original, for I am naturally inventive, as you know. Now I still think that for this box of matches to have escaped the wear of time for immemorial years was a most strange, as for me it was a most fortunate thing. Yet, oddly enough, 
I found a far unlikelier substance, and that was camphor. I found it in a sealed jar that by chance, I suppose, had been really hermetically sealed. I fancied at first that it was paraffin wax, and smashed the glass accordingly, but the odor of camphor was unmistakable. In the universal decay, this volatile substance had chanced to survive, perhaps through many thousands of centuries. It reminded me of a sepia painting I had once seen done from the ink of a fossil bellum bellumnite that might that must have perished and become fossilized millions of years ago i was about to throw it away but i remembered that it was inflammable and burned with a good bright flame was in fact an excellent candle and i put it in my pocket found no explosives however nor any means of breaking down the bronze doors and yet my iron crossbow was the most helpful thing I had chanced upon. Nevertheless, I left that gallery greatly elated. I cannot tell you all the story of that long afternoon. It would require a great effort of memory to recall my explorations in at all the proper order. I remember, I remember a long gallery of rusting stands of arms, and how I hesitated between my crowbar and a hatchet or a sword. I could not carry both, however, and my bar of iron promised best against the bronze gates. There were numbers of guns, pistols, and rifles. The most were masses of rust, but many were of some new metal, and still fairly sound but any cartridges or powder there may once have been had rotted into dust. One corner I saw was charred and shattered, perhaps, I thought, by an explosion among the specimens. In another place was a vast array of idols, Polynesian, Mexican, Grecian, Phoenician, even country on earth, every country on earth I could think. And here, yielding to an irresistible impulse, I wrote my name upon the nose of a steatite monster from south america that particularly took my fancy as the evening drew on my interest waned i went through gallery after gallery dusty silent often ruinous the exhibits sometimes mere heaps of rust and lignite sometimes fresher in one place i suddenly found myself near the model of a tin mine and then, by the merest accident, I discovered, in an airtight case, two dynamite cartridges. I shouted, Eureka! and smashed the case with joy. Then came a doubt. I hesitated. Then, selecting a little side gallery, I made my essay. I never felt such a disappointment as I did in waiting five, ten, fifteen minutes for an explosion that never came. Of course, the things were dummies, as I might have guessed from their presence. I really believed that had, had they not been so, I should have rushed off incontinently and blown sphinx, bronze doors, and, as it proved, my chances of finding the time machine, altogether into non-existence. It was after that, I think, that we came to a little open court within the palace. It was turfed and had three fruit trees. So we rested and refreshed ourselves. Towards sunset, I began to consider our position. Night was creeping upon us, and my inaccessible hiding place had still to be found. But that troubled me very little now. I had in my possession a thing that was, perhaps, the best of all defenses against the Morlocks. I had matches. I had the camphor in my pocket, too, if a blaze were needed. It seemed to me that the best thing we could do would be to pass the night in the open, protected by fire. In the morning there was the getting of the time machine. Towards that, as yet, I had only my iron mace. But now, with my growing knowledge, I felt very, in I felt very differently towards those bronze doors. Up to this, I had refrained from forcing them, largely because of the mystery on the other side. They had never impressed me as being very strong, and I hoped to find my bar of iron not altogether inadequate for the work. 
end of chapter eight. All right, so in this one, he's just sort of bopping around. Um, he does find time traveler stinky finds means of creating fire and sustaining it with like a makeshift torch of sorts. Um, and yeah, I still don't quite understand why we're scared of the Morlocks. They have done absolutely nothing. We don't even have proof that they took the time machine. And if we took the time to chat with them like we have with the Eloy, maybe we would figure some things out. But they do look scary. You're right. <laughs> Excuse me. You're correct. They do look scary. They are not cute and little and just sing and dance and eat fruits. <laughs> You're absolutely right. My mistake. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. And so, yeah, he found like a museum of sorts and was walking around and thought we found dynamite. We didn't. Wah, wah. But then there was the comment that was like, if it did blow up, then I would have blown up my chances for finding the time machine, which. Interesting. Interesting. All right. We'll see. Chapter 9. We emerged from the palace while the sun was still in part above the horizon. I was determined to reach the White Sphinx early the next morning, and ere the dusk I purposed pushing through the woods that had stopped me on the previous journey. My plan was to go as far as possible that night, and then, building a fire, to sleep in the protection of its glare. Accordingly, as we went along, I gathered my stick, any sticks or dried grass I saw, and presently had my arms full of such litter. Thus loaded, our progress was slower than I had anticipated, and besides, Weena was tired. And I began to suffer from sleepiness, too so that it was full night before we reached the wood. Upon the shrubby hill of its edge, Weena would have stopped, fearing the darkness before us, but a singular sense of impending calamity that should indeed have served me as a warning drove me onward. I had been without sleep for a night and two days, and I was feverish and irritable. I felt sleep coming upon me, and the Morlocks with it. While we hesitated, among the black bushes behind us, and dim against their blackness, I thought I saw three crouching figures. There was a scrub and long grass all about us, and I did not feel safe from their insidious approach. The forest, I calculated, was rather less than a mile across, if we could get through it to the bare hillside, there, as it seemed to me, was an altogether safer resting place. I thought that with my matches and my camphor I could contrive to keep my path illuminated through the woods. Yet it was evident that if I was to flourish matches with my hands, I should have to abandon my firewood. So, rather reluctantly, I put it down and then it came into my head that I would amaze our friends behind by lighting it. I was to discover the atrocious folly of this proceeding, but it came to my mind as an ingenious move for covering our retreat. I don't know if you have ever thought what a rare thing flame must be in the absence of man and in a temperate climate. The sun's heat is rarely strong enough to burn, even when it is focused by dewdrops, as is sometimes the case in more tropical districts. Lightning may blast and blacken, but it rarely gives rise to widespread fire. Decaying vegetation may occasionally smolder with the heat of its fermentation, but this rarely results in flame. In this decadence, too, the art of fire-making had been forgotten on the earth. The red tongues that went licking up my heap of wood were an altogether new and strange thing to Weena. 
is something about to happen to weena in this fire is that why she's not in the future or in the present weena girl get it together she wanted to run to it and play with it i believe she would have cast herself into it had i not restrained her but i caught her up and in spite of her struggles plunged boldly before me into the wood for a little way the glare of my fire lit the path looking back presently i could see through the crowded stems that from my heap of sticks the blaze had spread to some bushes adjacent and a curved line of fire was creeping up the grass of the hill i laughed at that and turned again to the dark trees before me it was very black and weena clung to me convulsively but there was still as my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness sufficient light for me to avoid the stems overhead it was simply black except where a gap of remote blue sky shone down upon us here and there i stuck none of my ma i struck none of my matches because i had no free hand upon my left arm i carried my little one in my right hand i had my iron bar for some way i heard nothing but the crackling twigs under my feet the faint rustle of the breeze above and my own breathing and the throb of the blood vessels in my ears then i seemed to know of a pattering about me i pushed on grimly the pattering grew more distinct and then i caught the same odd sound and voices i had heard in the underworld there were evidently several of the morlocks and they were closing in upon me indeed in another minute i felt a tug at my coat then something at my arm and weena shivered violently and became quite still it was time for a match but to get one i must put her down i did so and as i fumbled with my pocket a struggle began in the darkness about my knees perfectly silent on her part and with the same peculiar cooing sound from the morlocks soft little hands too were creeping over my coat and back touching even my neck then the match scratched and fizzed i held it flaring and saw the white backs of the morlocks in flight amid the trees i hastily took a lump of camphor from my pocket and prepared to light is as soon as the match should wane then i looked at weena she was lying clutching my feet and quite motionless and her face with her face to the ground with a sudden fright i stooped to her she seemed scarcely to breathe i lit the block of camphor and flung it to the ground and as it split and flared up and drove back the morlocks in the shadows i knelt down and lifted her the wood behind seemed full of the air and murmur of a great company she seemed to have fainted I put her carefully upon my shoulder and rose to push on, and then there came a horrible realization. In maneuvering with my matches and Weena, I had turned myself about several times, and now I had not the faintest idea in what direction lay my path. For all I knew, I might be facing back towards the palace of green porcelain. I found myself in a cold sweat. I had to think rapidly what to do. I determined to build a fire and encamp where we were. I put Weena, still motionless, down upon a turfy bowl, and very hastily, as my first lump of camphor waned, I began collecting sticks and leaves. Here and there about the darkness round me the Morlock's eyes shone like carbuncles. The camphor flickered and went out. I lit a match, and as I did so, two white forms that had been approaching Weena dashed hastily away. One was so blinded by the light that he came straight for me, and I felt his bones grind under the blow of my fist. He gave a whoop of dismay, staggered a little way, and fell down. I lit another piece of camphor and went on gathering my bonfire. Presently I noticed how dry was some of the foliage above me, for since my arrival on the time machine, a matter of a week, no rain had fallen. So, instead of casting about among the trees for fallen twigs, I began leaping up and dragging down branches. 
Very soon I had a choking, smoky fire of green wood and dry sticks, and could economize my camphor. Then I turned to where Weena lay beside my iron mace. I tried what I could to revive her, but she lay like one dead. I could not even satisfy myself whether or not she breathed. You should just punch them all. <laughs> just, just fists going. <laughs> now, the smoke of the fire beat toward me, and it must have made me heavy of a sudden. Moreover, the vapor of camphor was in the air. My fire would not need replenishing for an hour or so. I felt very weary after my exertion and sat down. The wood, too, was full of a slumberous murmur that I did not understand. It seemed just to nod and open my eye. I seemed just to nod and open my eyes. But all was dark, and the Morlocks had their hands upon me. Flinging off their clinging fingers, I hastily felt in my pocket for the matchbox, and it had gone. They had gripped and closed with me again. In a moment I knew what had happened. I had slept, and my fire had gone out, and the bitterness of death came over my soul. The forest seemed full of the smell of burning wood. I was caught by the neck, by the hair, by the arms, and pulled down. It was indescribably horrible in the darkness to feel all these soft creatures heaped upon me. I felt as if I was in a monstrous spider's web. I was overpowered and went down. I felt little teeth nipping at my neck. I rolled over, and as I did so, my hand came against my iron lever. It gave me strength. I struggled up, shaking the human rats from me, and holding the bar short, I thrust where I judged their faces might be. I could feel the succulent giving of flesh and bone under my blows, and for a moment I was free. The strange exultation that so often seemed to accompany hard fighting came upon me. I knew that both I and Weena were lost, but I determined to make the Morlocks pay for their meat. I stood with my back to a tree, swinging the iron bar before me. The whole wood was full of the stir and cries of them. A minute passed. Their voices seemed to rise to a higher pitch of excitement, and their movements grew faster. Yet none came within reach. I stood glaring at the blackness. Then suddenly came hope. What if the Morlocks were afraid? And close on the heels of that came a strange thing. The darkness seemed to grow luminous. Very dimly I began to see the Morlocks about me. Three battered at my feet. And then I recognized, with incredulous surprise, that the others were running in an incessant stream, as it seemed, from behind me, and away through the wood in front, and their backs seemed no longer white, but reddish. As I stood agape, I saw a little red spark go drifting across a gap of starlight between the branches and vanish, and at that I understood the smell of burning wood, the, slum the slumberous murmur that was growing now into a gusty roar, the red glow, and the Morlocks' flight. Stepping out from behind my tree and looking back, I saw, through the black pillars of the nearer trees, the flames of the burning forest. It was my first fire coming after me. With that, I looked for Weena, but she was gone. The hissing and crackling behind me, the explosive thud as each fresh tree burst into flame, left little time for reflection. My iron bar still gripped. I followed in the Morlock's path. It was a close race. Once the flames crept forward so swiftly on my right as I ran that I was outflanked and had to strike off to the left. But at last I emerged upon a small open space, and as I did so, a Morlock came blundering toward me and past me and went on straight into the fire. And now I see... And now I was to see the most weird and horrible thing, I think, of all that I beheld in that future age. This whole space was as bright as day with the reflection of the fire. 
The center was a hillock or tumulus surmounted by a scorched hawthorn. Beyond this was another arm of the burning forest, with yellow tongues already writhing from it, completely encircling the space with a fence of fire. Upon the hillside were some thirty or forty Morlocks, dazzled by the light and heat, and blundering hither and thither against each other in their bewilderment. At first I did not realize their blindness, and struck furiously at them with my bar, in a frenzy of fear as they approached me, killing one and crippling several more. But when I had watched the gestures of one of them groping under the hawthorn against the red sky and heard their moans, I was assured of their absolute helplessness and misery in the glare, and I struck no more of them. Yet every now and then one would come straight towards me, setting loose a quivering horror that made me quick to elude them. At one time the flames died down somewhat, and I feared the foul creatures would presently be able to see me. I was thinking of beginning the fight by killing some of them before this should happen, but the fire burst out again brightly, and I stayed my hand. I walked about the hill among them and avoided them, looking for some trace of Weena. But Weena was gone. At last I sat down on the summit of the hillock and watched this strange, incredible company of blind things groping to and fro and making uncanny noises to each other as the glare of the fire beat on them. The coiling uprush of smoke streamed across the sky and through the rare tatters of that red canopy, remote as though they belonged to another universe, shone the little stars. Two or three Morlocks came blundering into me and I drove them off with blows of my fist, trembling as I did so. For the most part of that night I was persuaded it was a nightmare. I bit myself and screamed in a passionate desire to awake. I beat the ground with my hands and got up and sat down again and wandered here and there and again sat down. Then I would fall to rubbing my eyes and calling about upon God to let me awake. Thrice I saw Morlocks put their heads down in a kind of agony and rush into the flames, but, at last, above the subsiding red of the fire, above the streaming masses of black smoke and the whitening and blackening tree stumps and the diminishing numbers of these dim creatures, came the white light of the day. I searched again for traces of Lena, but there were none. It was plain that they had left her poor little body in the forest. I cannot describe how it relieved me to think that it had escaped the awful fate to which it seemed destined. As I thought of that, I was almost moved to begin a massacre of the helpless abominations about me, but I contained myself. The hillock, as I have said, was a kind of island in the forest. From its summit I could now make out through a haze of smoke the palace of green porcelain, and from that I could get my bearings for the white sphinx. And so, leaving the remnant of these damned souls still going hither and thither and moaning as the day grew clearer, I tied some grass about my feet and limped on across smoking ashes and among black stems that still pulsed, pulsated internally with fire towards the hiding place of the time machine. I walked slowly, for I was almost exhausted as well as lame, and I felt the intensest wretchedness for the horrible death of little Weena. It seemed an overwhelming calamity. Now, in this old familiar room, it is more like the sorrow of a dream than an actual loss. But that morning it left me absolutely lonely again, terribly alone. I began to think of this house of mine, of this fireside, of some of you, and with such thoughts came a longing that was pain. But as I walked over the smoking ashes under the bright morning sky, I made a discovery. In my trouser pocket was still some loose matches. The box must have leaked before it was lost. End of chapter nine. These damn matches, let me tell ya. <laughs> okay, so this one was a horrifying chapter. Terrible. 
Terrible, terrible, terrible. Okay, so Stinky Time Traveler is walking about with Weena, going to protect each other against the against the Morlocks because it is the new moon and the Morlocks can bop about without fear of, of light. And in doing so, Stinky Time Traveler accidentally lights a massive forest fire. Well, before that, he lights a little fire <laughs> for him and Weena to just sort of, like, rest. And this is something that Weena, ha like, hasn't seen before, like a little campfire. And she's just so interested in it and just, like, wants to go into it like a little moth to the flame. And Stinky is like, mm-mm, no, 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 don't do that, mm, -mm. And so that happens. And then all of the Morlocks... Later, once this fire is ravaging, they cannot see. They are blinded because it is so bright from the fire. And they're not a threat anymore. And Stinky is still punching them, beating them down with this metal stick. And they're just running into the fire. That is dark, my friend. That is dark. And we don't even know if the Morlocks are bad. We don't know that at all. They have made no indication that they were going to attack. At most, they were interested. I mean, Stinky sort of interprets that they, I think that, were the bones, was the, like, the meat that he found, was that supposed to be Eloy? Were they eating Eloy? Is that why they were so scared of them? Because if that's the case... Gotta eat. <laughs> you gotta eat. I don't know. I don't know. Stinky ruins everything. Couldn't have said it better. Mm -mm -mm. Chapter 10. About 8 or 9 in the morning. Oh, not chapter 10. And then he just finds the time machine. He just finds it. It's there. Found it. Okay. Chapter 10. <laughs> About 8 or 9 in the morning, I came to the same seat of yellow metal from which I had viewed the world upon the evening of my arrival. I thought of my hasty conclusions upon that evening and could not refrain from laughing bitterly at my confidence. Here was the same beautiful scene, the same abundant foliage, the same splendid palaces and magnificent ruins, the same silver river running between its fertile banks. The robes of the beautiful people moved hither and thither among the trees. Some were bathing in exactly the place they were where I saved Weena, and that suddenly gave me a keen stab of pain. And like bolts upon, and like blots upon the landscape rose the cupolas above the ways to the underworld. I understood now what all the beauty of the overworld people covered. Very pleasant was their day, as pleasant as the day of the cattle in the field. Like the cattle, they knew of no enemies and provided against no needs, and their end was the same. I grieved to think how brief the dream of the human intellect had been. It had committed suicide. It had set itself steadfastly toward comfort and ease, a balanced society with security and permanency as its watchword. It had attained its hope. To come to this at last. Once, life and property must have reached almost absolute safety. The rich had been assured of his wealth and comfort, the toiler assured of his life and work. No doubt in that perfect world— there had been no unemployed problem, no social question left unsolved, and a great quiet had followed. 
it is a law of nature we overlook that intellectual versatility is the compensation for change danger and trouble an animal perfectly in harmony with its environment is a perfect mechanism nature never appeals to intelligence until habit and instinct are useless there is no intelligence where there is no change and no need of change only those animals partake of intelligence that have to meet a huge variety of needs and dangers so as i see it the upper world man had drifted towards his feeble prettiness and the underworld to mere mechanical industry but that perfect state had lacked one thing even for mechanical perfection absolute permanency apparently as time went on the feeding of the underworld however it was affected had become disjointed mother necessity who had been staved off for a few thousand years came back again and she began below the underworld being in contact with machinery which however perfect still needs some little thought outside habit had probably retained perforce rather more initiative if less of every other human character than the upper and when other meat failed them they turned to what old habit had hitherto forbidden so i say i saw it in my last view of the world of eight hundred and two thousand seven hundred and one it may be as wrong in explanation as mortal wit could invent it is how the thing shaped itself to me and as that i give it to you after the fatigues excitements and terrors of the past days and in spite of my grief this seat and the tranquil view and the warm sunlight were very pleasant i was very tired and sleepy and soon my theorizing passed into dozing catching myself at last i took my own hint and spreading myself out upon the turf i had a long and refreshing sleep i awoke a little before sunsetting i now felt safe against being caught napping by the morlocks and stretching myself i came on down the hill towards the white sphinx i had my crossbow in one hand and the other hand played with the matches in my pocket got a little pyro on our hands over here and now came a most unexpected thing as i approached the pedestal of the sphinx i found the bronze valves were open they had slid down into grooves and at that i stopped short before them hesitating to enter yeah a right rambo over here <laughs> within was a small apartment and on a raised place in the corner of it was the time machine i had the small levers in my pocket so here after all my elaborate preparations for the siege of the white sphinx was a meek surrender i threw my iron bar away almost sorry not to use it a sudden thought came into my head as i stooped towards the portal for once at least I grasped the mental operations of the Morlocks. Suppressing a strong inclination to laugh, I stepped through the bronze frame and up to the time machine. I was surprised to find it had been carefully oiled and cleaned. I have suspected since that the Morlocks had even partially taken it to pieces while trying in their dim way to grasp its purpose. Now as I stood and examined it, finding a pleasure in the mere touch of the contrivance, the thing I had expected happened. The bronze panels suddenly slid up and struck the frame with a clang. I was in the dark. Trapped. So the Morlocks thought. At that, I chuckled gleefully. I could already hear their murmuring laughter as they came toward me. Very calmly, I tried to strike the match. I had only to fix on the levers and depart then like a ghost. But I had overlooked one little thing. The matches were of that abominable kind that light only on the box. You may imagine how all my calm vanished. The little brutes were close upon me. One touched me. I made a sweeping blow in the dark at them with the levers and began to scramble into the saddle of the machine. 
Then came one hand upon me, and then another. Then I had simply to fight against their persistent fingers for my lovers, and at the same time feel for the studs over which these fitted. One, indeed, they almost got away from me. As it slipped from my hand, I had to butt in the dark with my head. I could hear the Morlock's skull ring to recover it. It was a nearer thing than the fight in the forest, I think, the scramble. But at last the lever was fitted and pulled over. The clinging hands slipped from me. The darkness presently fell from my eyes. I found myself in the same grey light and tumult I have already described. End of chapter 10. All right, so Stinky comes out ready for a fight and is like, oh, they have just merely surrendered the time machine. He goes in behind the bronze doors. The bronze doors, they close. And Stinky is like, oh, I've prepared for this for I have matches. Matches are the kind that you have to strike on the box. He's like, mm, what am I going to do? So then he just starts like head button and like punching <laughs> oh <laughs> and you know as he's trying to get the levers in and then he gets it in <laughs> have at you exactly exactly <laughs> oh stinky 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 what are we to do with you Terrible. Oh, wait. I need a sip before we continue on. We only have two more chapters. Here we go. That's me imitating Stinky, punching and headbutting everybody. <laughs> Chapter 11 I have already told you of the sickness and confusion that comes with time traveling, and this time I was not seated properly in the saddle, but sideways and in an unstable fashion. Just go inside, saddle. <laughs> For an indefinite time I clung to the machine as it swayed and vibrated, quite unheeding how I went. And when I brought myself to look at the dials again, I was amazed to find where I had arrived. One dial records days, and another thousands of days, another millions of days, and another thousands of millions. Now, instead of reversing the levers, I had pulled them over so as to go forward with them. And when I came to look at these indicators, I found that the thousands hand was sweeping round as fast as the second hand of a watch into futurity. Oh, totally. I did not have the 19th century gentleman fighter stance. You're right. I'll work on that. <laughs> My form was completely off. <laughs> as I drove on, a peculiar change crept over the appearance of things. The palpitating grayness grew darker. Then, though I was still traveling with prodigious velocity, the blinking succession of day and night, which was usually indicative of a slower pace, returned, and grew more and more marked. This puzzled me very much at first. The alternations of night and day grew slower and slower, and so did the passage of the sun across the sky, until they seemed to stretch through centuries. At last, a steady twilight brooded over the earth, a twilight only broken now and then with a comet glared across the darkling sky. The band of light that had indicated the sun had long since disappeared, for the sun had ceased to set. It simply rose and fell in the west, and grew ever broader and more red. All trace of the moon had vanished. The circling of the stars, growing slower and slower, had given place to creeping points of light. At last, some time before I stopped, the sun, red and very large, halted motionless upon the horizon, a vast dome glowing with a dull heat, and now and then suffering a momentary extinction. 
at one time it had for a little while glowed more brilliantly again but it speedily reverted to its sullen red heat i perceived by this slowing down of its rising and setting that the work of the tidal drag was done the earth had come to rest with one face to the sun even as in our own time the moon faces the earth very cautiously for i remembered my former headlong fall i began to reverse my motion slower and slower went the circling hands until the thousands one seems seemed motionless and the daily one was no longer a mere mist upon its scale still slower until the dim outlines of a desolate beach grew visible i stopped very gently and sat upon the time machine looking around the sky was no longer blue northeastward it was inky black and out of the bl blackness shone brightly and steadily the pale white stars overhead it was a deep red and starless and southeastward it grew brighter to a glowing scarlet where cut by the horizon lay a huge hull of the sun red and motionless the rocks about me were a half were a harsh reddish color and all the trace of life that i could see at first was the intensely green vegetation that covered every projecting point on their southeastern face it was the same rich green that one sees on forest moss or on the lichen in caves plants which like these grow in a perpetual light the machine was standing on a sloping beach the sea stretched away from the southwest to rise into a sharp bright horizon against the wane sky there were no breakers and no waves for not a breath of wind was stirring only a slight oily swell rose and fell like a gentle breathing and showed that the eternal sea was still moving and living and along the margin where the water sometimes broke was a thick incrustation of salt pink under the lurid sky there was a sense of oppression in my head and i noticed that i was breathing very fast the sensation reminded me of my only experience of mountaineering and from that i judged the air to be more rarefied than it is now far away up the desolate slope i heard a harsh scream and saw a thing like a huge white butterfly go slanting and flitting up into the sky and circling disappear over some low hillocks below the sound of its voice was so dismal that i shivered and seated myself more firmly upon the machine looking round me again i saw that quite near what i had taken to be a reddish mass of rock was moving slowly towards me then i saw the thing was really a monstrous crab-like creature can you imagine a crab as large as yonder table with its many legs moving slowly and uncertainly its big claws swaying its long antennae like carter's whips waving and feeling and its stalked eyes gleaming at you on either side of its metallic front its back was corrugated and ornamented with ungainly bosses and a greenish incrustation blotched it here and there i could see the many palps of its complicated mouth flickering and feeling as it moved as i stared at the sinister apparition crawling towards me i felt a tickling on my cheek as though a fly had lighted there i tried to brush it away with my hand but in a moment it returned and almost immediately came another by my ear i struck at this and caught something thread-like it was drawn swiftly out of my hand with a frightful qualm i turned and i saw that i had grasped the antenna of another monster crab that stood just behind me its evil eyes were wriggling on their stalks its mouth was all alive with appetite and its vast ungainly claws smeared with an ogle's slime was were descending upon me in a moment my hand was on the lever and i had placed a month between myself and these monsters but i was still on the same beach and i saw them distinctly now as soon as i stopped 
dozens of them seemed to be crawling here and there in the sombre light among the foliated sheets of intense green i cannot convey the sense of abominable desolation that hung over the world the red eastern sky the northward blackness the salt dead sea the stony beach crawling with these foul slow-stirring monsters the uniform poisonous-looking green of the lichenous plants the thin air that hurts one's lungs all contributed to an appalling effect i moved on a hundred years and there was the same red sun a little larger a little duller the same dying sea the same chill air and the same crowd of earthy crustacea creeping in and out among the green weed and the red rocks and in the westward sky i saw a curved pale line like a vast new moon so i travelled stopping ever and again and in great strides of a thousand years or more drawn on by the mystery of the earth's fate watching with a strange fascination the sun grow larger and duller in the westward sky and the life of the old earth ebb away at last more than thirty million years hence the huge red-hot dome of the sun had come to obscure nearly a tenth part of the darkling heavens then i stopped once more for the crawling multitude of crabs had disappeared and the red beach save for its livid green liverworts and lichens seemed lifeless and now it was flecked with white a bitter cold assailed me rare white flakes ever and again came eddying down to the northeastward the glare of snow lay under the starlight of the sable sky and i could see an undulating crest of hillocks pinkish white there were fringes of ice along the sea margin with drifting masses further out but the main expanse of that salt ocean all bloody under the eternal sunset was still unfrozen i looked about me to see if any traces of animal life remained a certain indefinable apprehension still kept me in the saddle of the machine but i saw nothing moving in sky in earth or sky or sea the green slime on the rocks alone testified that life was not extinct a shallow sandbank had re had appeared in the sea and the water had receded from the beach i fancied i saw some black object flopping about upon this bank but it became motionless as i looked at it and i judged that my eye had been deceived and that the black object was merely a rock the stars in the sky were intensely bright and seemed to me to twinkle very little suddenly i noticed that the circular westward outline of the sun had changed that a concavity a bay had appeared in the curve i saw this grow larger for a minute perhaps i stared aghast at this blackness that was creeping over the day and then i realized that an eclipse was beginning either the moon or the planet mercury was passing across the sun's disk naturally at first i took it to be the moon but there is much to incline me to believe that what i really saw was the transit of an inner planet passing very near to the earth the darkness grew a piece a pace a cold wind began to blow in refreshing gusts from the east and the showering white flakes in the air increased in number from the edge of the sea came a ripple and whisper beyond these lifeless sounds the world was silent silent it would be hard to convey the stillness of it all the sounds of man the bleating of sheep the cries of birds the hum of insects the stir that makes the background of our lives all that was over as the darkness thickened the eddying flakes grew more abundant dancing before my eyes and the cold of the air more intense at last one by one swiftly one after the other the white peaks of the distant hills vanished into blackness the breeze rose to a moaning wind i saw the black central shadow of the eclipse sweeping towards me in another moment the pale stars alone were visible all else 
was rayless obscurity. The sky was absolutely black. A horror of this great darkness came on me. The cold that smote to my marrow and the pain I felt in breathing overcame me. I shivered, and a deadly nausea seized me. Then, like a red-hot bow in the sky, appeared the edge of the sun. I got off the machine to recover myself. I felt giddy and incapable of facing the return journey. As I stood sick and confused, I saw again the moving thing upon the shoal. There was no mistake now that it was a moving thing against the red water of the sea. It was a round thing, the size of a football, perhaps, or it may be bigger, and the tentacles trailed down from it. It seemed black against the weltering, blood-red water, and it was hopping fitfully about. Then I felt I was fainting, but a terrible dread of laying helpless in that remote and awful twilight sustained me while I clambered upon the saddle. End of chapter 11. All right, so Stinky the Time Traveler hops on his time machine and goes again into the future, very far into the future. We were already very far in the future. Now we're going even further. And it's just super, super dark. And there are these massive, crab-like, scary creatures, and Stinky scared, so he moves, like, a month or so ahead. And now it's daytime, and he's just, like, looking about, and, yeah. He said it's very, very quiet, like, unable to describe how quiet. There aren't noises from, like, any animals or from any humans and that sounds so eerie to me. Um, like, that stillness is wild. And it almost reminds me of, like, like that same kind of unnerving, like, uh, if you go to, like the office or if you go to like a school or whatever and nobody's around like at night or something and it's just like nobody's there things are left exactly as they were like zombie apocalypse type feel almost that's that same kind of feel i think it would be like all right Chapter 12. So I came back. For a long time I must have been insensible upon the machine. The blinking succession of the days and nights was resumed. The sun got golden again. The sky blue. I breathed with greater freedom. The fluctuating contours of the land ebbed and flowed. The hands spun backwards upon the dial. At last I saw again the dim shadows of houses, the evidences of decadent humanity. These, too, changed and passed, and others came. Presently, when the million dial was at zero, I slacked speed. I began to recognize our own pretty and familiar architecture. The thousand's hand ran back to the starting point. The night and day flapped slower and slower. Then the old walls of the laboratory came round me. Very gently, now, I slowed the mechanism down. I saw one little thing that seemed odd to me. I think I have told you that when I set out before my velocity became very high, Mrs. Watchett had walked across the room, traveling, as it seemed to me, like a rocket. As I returned, I passed again across that minute when she traversed the laboratory. But now... Her every motion appeared to be the exact inverse of her previous one. The door at the lower end opened, and she glided quietly up the laboratory, back foremost, and disappeared behind the door by which she had previously entered. Just before that I seemed to see Hillier for a moment, but he passed like a flash. Then I stopped the machine and saw about me again the old familiar laboratory, my tools, my appliances, just as I had left them. 
I got off the thing very shaky and sat down upon my bench. For several minutes I trembled violently. Then I became calmer. Around me was my old workshop again, exactly as it had been. I might have slept there, and the whole thing had been a dream. And yet, not exactly. The thing had started from the southeast corner of the laboratory. It had come to rest again in the northwest, again the wall where you saw it. That gives you the exact distance from my little lawn to the pedestal of the white sphinx, into which the Morlocks had carried my machine. For a time my brain went stagnant. Presently I got up and came through the passage here, limping because my heel was still painful, and feeling sorely begrimmed. I saw the Pall Mall Gazette on the table by the door. I found the date was indeed today, and looking at the timepiece saw the hour was almost eight o'clock. I heard your voices and the clatter of plates. I hesitated. I felt so sick and weak. Then I sniffed good wholesome meat and opened the door on you. You know the rest. I washed and dined, and now I am telling you the story. I know, he said, after a pause, that all this will be absolutely incredible to you. To me, the one incredible thing is that I am here tonight in this old familiar room, looking into your friendly faces and telling you these strange adventures. He looked at the medical man. No, I cannot expect you to believe it. Take it as a lie or a prophecy. Say I dreamed it in the workshop. Consider I have been speculating upon the destinies of our race until I have hatched this fiction. Treat my assertion of its truth as a mere stroke of art to enhance its interest, and taking it as a story, what do you think of it? He took up his pipe and began, in his old, accustomed manner, to tap with it nervously upon the bars of the grate. There was a momentary stillness. Then chairs began to creak and shoes to scrape upon the carpet. I took my eyes off the tra time traveler's face and looked round at his audience. They were in the dark, and little spots of color swam before them. The medical man seemed absorbed in the contemplation of our host. The editor was looking hard at the end of his cigar, at the sixth. The journalist fumbled for his watch. The others, as far as I remember, were motionless. The editor stood up with a sigh. "'What a pity it is you're not a writer of stories,' he said, putting his hand on the time-traveler's shoulder. "'You don't believe it? Well, look, I, I thought not.' The time-traveler turned to us. "'Where are the matches?' he asked. He lit one and spoke over his pipe, puffing. "'To tell you the truth, I hardly believe it myself. "'And yet?' His eye fell with a mute inquiry upon the withered white flowers upon the little table. Then he turned over the hand holding his pipe, and I saw he was looking at some half-healed scars on his knuckles. The medical man rose came to the lamp and examined the flowers. "'That's odd,' he said. The psychologist leaned forward to see, holding out his hand for the specimen. "'I'm hanged if it isn't a quarter to one,' said the journalist. "'How should we get home?' "'Plenty of cabs at the station,' said the psychologist. "'It's a curious thing,' said the medical man. "'But I certainly don't know the nature, the natural order of these flowers. "'May I have them?' The time-traveler hesitated, then suddenly, certainly not. "'Where did you really get them?' said the medical man. The time-traveler put his hand to his head. He spoke like the one who was trying to keep hold of an idea that eluded him. "'They were put into my pocket by Weena when I traveled into time.' He stared round the room. I'm damned if it isn't all going. This room and you and the atmosphere of every day is too much for my memory. Did I ever make a time machine? Or a model of a time machine? Or is it all only a dream? They say life is a dream. A precious, poor dream at times. But I can't stand another that won't fit. It's madness. And where did the dream come from? I must look at the machine, if there is one. He caught up the lamp swiftly and carried it, flaring red, through the door into the corridor. We followed him. 
there in the flickering light of the lamp was a machine sure enough squat ugly and askew a thing of brass ebony ivory and translucent glimmering quartz solid to the touch for i put out my hand and felt the rail of it and with brown spots and smears upon the ivory and bits of grass and moss upon the lower parts and one rail bent awry the time traveller put the lamp down on the bench and ran his hand along the damaged rail it's all right now he said the story i told you was true i'm sorry to have brought you out here in the cold he took up the lamp and in an absolute silence we returned to the smoking-room he came into the hall with us and helped the editor on with his coat the medical man looked into his face and with a certain hesitation told him he was suffering from overwork at which he laughed hugely i remember him standing in the door open doorway bawling good night i shared a cab with the editor he thought the tale a gaudy lie for my own part i was unable to come to a conclusion the story was so fantastic and incredible the telling so credible and sober i lay awake most of the night thinking about it i determined to go next day and see the time traveller again i was told he was in the laboratory and being on easy terms in the house i went up to see him the laboratory however was empty i stared for a minute at the time machine and put out my hand and touched the lever at that the squat substantial-looking mass swayed like a bow shaken by the wind its instability startled me extremely and i had an odd reminiscence of the childish days when i used to be forbidden to meddle i came back through the corridor the time traveller met me in the smoking-room he was coming from the house he had a small camera under one arm and a knapsack under the other he laughed when he saw me and gave me an elbow to shake i'm frightfully busy said he with that thing in there but is it not some hoax i asked do you really travel through time really and truly i do and he looked frankly into my eyes he hesitated his eye wandered about the room i only want half an hour he said i know why you came and it's awfully good of you there's some magazines here if you'll stop to lunch i'll prove you this time travelling up to the hilt specimen and all if you'll forgive my leaving you now i consented hardly comprehending then the full import of his words and he nodded and went on down the corridor i heard the door of the laboratory slam seated myself in a chair and looked up at a daily paper what was he going to do before lunch time and suddenly i was reminded by an advertisement that i had promised to meet richardson the publisher at two i looked at my watch and saw that i could barely save that engagement i got up and went down the passage to tell the time traveller as i took hold of the handle of the door i heard an exclamation oddly truncated at the end and a click and a thud a gust of air whirled round me as i opened the door and from within came the sound of broken glass falling on the floor the time traveller was not there i seemed to see a ghostly indistinct figure sitting in a whirling mass of black and brass for a moment a figure so transparent that the bench behind it with its sheets of drawings was absolutely distinct but this phantasm vanished as i rubbed my eyes the time machine had gone save for a subsiding stir of dust the further end of the laboratory was empty a pane of the skylight had apparently just been blown in i felt an unreasonable amazement i knew that something strange had happened and for the moment could not distinguish what the strange thing might be as i stood staring the door into the garden opened and the man-servant appeared we looked at each other then ideas began to come has mr gone away stinky there's like a huge dash so has mr stinky gone out that way i asked no sir no one has come out this way i was expecting to find him here at that i understood at the risk of disappointing richardson i stayed on waiting for the time traveller waiting for the second perhaps still stranger story 
and the specimens and photographs he would bring with him, but I am beginning now to fear that I must wait a lifetime. The time traveler vanished three years ago, and, as everybody knows now, he has never returned. Surprised there was any glass left to break. I know. That is the end of chapter 12. But we have an epilogue. Okay, so, oops, finished the story. Everyone's like, mm, I don't think that's real. But not us. Not us. I think we named ourselves Tingles. Tingles might think it's real. So, goes home, can't sleep, just constantly thinking about that. This next day goes to the time traveler. The time traveler was like, I will give me, you know, 30 minutes. Come back at lunch. We will discuss. And um, Tingles were like, all right, cool. We'll do that. Um, we have a lunch. Maybe we'll, maybe we, we have plans with Richardson. Maybe we'll go do that. And then we're going to go tell Stinky to uh, open the door. Oh, no, we're going to, we're not going to tell Stinky to open the door. We're going to tell Stinky that we'll be right back. And we go to open the door and we see like them, them as in the time machine and Stinky time traveling, disappearing all the glass is broken, blah, blah, blah. And so us tingles <laughs> decides to stay and wait. However, it's been three years. And now it's been more than three years and the time traveler has not returned yet. Bum, bum, bum. Gone like a fart in the wind. <laughs> All right, we have an epilogue. Ooh, it's a short one. It's a shorty. Here we go. Epilogue. One cannot choose to wander. Will he ever return? It may be that he swept back into the past and fell among the blood-drinking, hairy savages of the age of unpolished stone, into the abysses of the Crustacea Sea, or among the grotesque Saurians, the huge reptilian brutes of the Jurassic times. He may even now, if I may use the phrase, be wandering on some plesiosaurus haunted oolitic coral reef, or beside the lonely saline lakes of the Triassic age. Or did he go forward into one of the nearer ages in which men are still men, but the riddles of our own time answered and its wearisome problems solved? into the manhood of the race, for I, for my own part, cannot think that these later days of weak experiment, fragmentary theory, and mutual discord are indeed man's culminating time. I say, for my own part, he, I know, for the question had been discussed among us long before the time machine was made, thought but cheerlessly of the advancement of mankind, and saw in the growing pile of civilization only a foolish heaping that must inevitably fall back upon and destroy its makers in the end. If that is so, it remains for us to live as though it were not. But to me the future is still black and blank. It is vast ignorance, lit at in few casual places by the memory of his story. And I have by me, for my comfort, two strange white flowers, shriveled now, and brown, and flat, and brittle, to witness that even when mind and strength had gone, gratitude and a mutual tenderness still lived on in the heart of man. The end. Time traveling the old-fashioned way. <laughs> Oof. All right. What did we think? We like. Um, let's get a reminder of when this was published. 1895. It's it's a little old. Um, I enjoyed it. I did like it. I I actually really like that he disap that Stinky disappeared and didn't come back. 
I actually really enjoy that detail. Just because there's, like, so much mystery enshrouded in it. And, like, time travel or time travel or time travel is wild and unpredictable and all those things. It was new in Back to the Future Part 3. <laughs> so, I'm a little... Oh, you are underwhelmed. Ooh. Ooh. I kind of thought that... I I understand. I do think that the st- story could have taken more turns. Um, I think that it could have been revealed... I mean, I said this earlier, that maybe those two races, the Eloys and the Morlocks, are not actually human, but that there was, like, another race that was actually human. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, we don't know the true nature of the Morlocks, and I felt like their demise was really quick. We spent a lot of time with the Eloys and not very much time with the Morlocks. Like, we took the time to get to know the Eloys and to learn their language and to have a weird relationship, but we did not do that with the Morlocks. We just immediately assumed that they were terrible and wanted war. But I don't know if they did. (laughs) You know, I just don't know. Like, so he found meat of the alloys. He didn't explicitly say it, but that's what we're guessing. But that is what they eat. That doesn't mean that they're, like, gonna start a war or be barbaric or anything like that. Like, that's just, it's, it's their food. Om nom nom. I have this same idea. So the time traveler goes back to this age, goes into the Morlocks' home, starts punching them for the Morlocks just being Morlocks and doing the Morlock thing. Um, Morlocks did not go out and attack him or anything like that. And it's just like the same idea of like in like video games like Monster Hunter. When you go to the monster's, like, home and they're sleeping and then you're just like, ha, 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 and, like, attack them. Like, it's that same idea. Like, the monster wasn't doing anything. monster was just having a good old nap in this stream, but it's fine. Maybe the alloy are, like, cattle for them and they're ranchers. Exactly. Exactly. I think they were compared to cattle, too. So it makes sense. Like, you can't come in. You can't just barge in here with your 19th century attitude and (laughs) expectations and just say that the future is wrong. Can't do that. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. Things have changed. Times have changed. Yeah. And they take care of their cattle with clothes and stuff. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So, yes. H.G. Wells. That's our second H.G. Wells that we have read. We also read War of the Worlds forever ago that was the first book that we've read on stream more than a year ago so that's cool um but yeah i'm trying to think i don't think i have any other any other thoughts it is it's always interesting reading like the older materials and seeing the themes and the uh tropes that have been passed along you know you know you know the saying, letting the stinky in the chicken coop. Exactly. We all know the saying. <laughs> and having time travel just be just a thing that's just part of science fiction now is pretty cool. Yeah. Back to the future. All the all the, the greats. <laughs> Isn't there time travel in Terminator as well? feel like it is i don't know i might have made that up yes okay cool i have not seen it 
<laughs> I have not seen the Terminator, and I feel like I need to now. Now that I've made this bold claim without having anything to back it up. Um, yeah. So we'll start a, no- a new book next week. It'll be great. It'll be a good time. Um, but that's gonna be it for tonight. I hope you all have a great night. I hope you all have a great weekend. I will be back next week with a new book. <laughs> As always, whether you're new or no, what am I saying? Whether you're new, that's not what I say. As always, whether you chat, whether you lurk, I 1000% appreciate you. And I 1000% appreciate your support. Have a good one, everyone. Goodbye.